Our Lord, uh, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, just grateful for another week. And God, as we um, have had lots of moments in this past week, which are very good and just so much to celebrate, Lord, we also have lots of uh, painful moments to endure through. And Lord, I pray that um, we would know uh, just how good and faithful you are through everything, no matter what it looks like, Lord. We know that uh, you are a good God. So God, we um, want to know you better tonight. We want to know you more accurately, um, to love you more, to follow you more. So um, we open up our hearts to you, Lord, uh, to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we ended chapter 12 with this call to walk out our salvation in a way that's sort of this witness to the world. So Paul gave all of these like rapid fire uh, admonitions to uh, have, your, have your salvation actually play out in your words and your deeds. Um, that's what it means to be light in a dark world, to be the salt of the earth. Uh, that's what becomes evangelical and a testimony and a witness to other people. Uh, if they don't like the way you're living and they don't admire the way you're living, then to say that you've been changed and that you've been, um, you're living for somebody, uh, it's not a very attractive offer if they're not very impressed with your integrity. Um, so how we live is very, very important to our, our testimony. So Paul's going to make this a bit of a shift here as he finished the last chapter saying we're to overcome evil with good. Um, so now as individuals, as he calls us to overcome evil with good, now he's going to give us this bigger picture of how we are to do that on a national level. Uh, so he's going to be speaking uh, of government authorities in this chapter. So let's get into it. Uh, first verse, chapter 13, says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So Paul is now appealing to the individual. He was already appealing to the individual soul, <coughs> and he's appealing to the individual soul because Paul's been a victim of mob mentality. Paul will go and he'll, he'll preach and things, and when He's dealing one-on-one -on -one with somebody, that's one thing. But when a mob gets together, it becomes a whole entire different situation. That's when Paul got beaten, he got stoned, he, he, his life was constantly threatened by mobs. And I watched a video, uh, a documentary, not a documentary, I watched a video, a uh, half-hour video the other day, of these couple guys from a certain church, I don't know where, I don't know where they were from, but they had these signs, you know, against abortion, and they had their charts, and they were showing what happens in an abortion, and they knew their stuff. They were able to give great details, and they set up on a college campus, and they were just welcoming people coming up to them. And when the first person came up, there was a conversation, and it was back and forth, and it was fine. Then people started noticing what was going on and coming around, and then people would shout from the back instead of coming up and talking. They would just shout things, and they would just shout things back, and, and it just became very argumentative. And then you notice at the end of the half, an hour, at the end of the half hour that the pro-abortion group was much more fervent in their pro-abortion. They were angry. They were yelling. They were calling names and all these things. As soon as you hit that mob mentality, you're in trouble. Okay, And somebody sent me that video and they said, look what a great job these guys did because their points were very solid, but the result was terrible. The result probably did more damage than good, even though everything they said couldn't be countered. What they tried to counter with, they were able to refute. So there was just absolutely no nothing gained there whatsoever. So Paul's appealing even though he's going to talk about government now, he says, let every soul, so every single one of us, every single one of us, accountable to ourselves for being found faithful to these texts. So let every single soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. So that's his reasoning there. 
He's saying, understand, you're not going to always agree with government. We're going to talk about what is that line of disagreement to actually call to godly disobedience to your government. We're going to talk about that. But Paul's establishing right now that there is no authority except from God. And if you're saying it can't possibly be evil government, then let me just remind you what Jesus said to Pilate. Pilate said, I have the authority to take your life or to save your life. And Jesus didn't disagree. He said, you only have that authority because you got it from my father. So he acknowledged Pilate in his, in his wrongness and evilness and wickedness and all of that had authority given by God, even though it was not in what we would say God's service. Jesus paid a huge price for that authority. But he acknowledged that authority, and that authority of Pontius Pilate was given to, by God and acknowledged by Jesus. Now, <clears throat> so Paul appeals to the individual soul. The gospel given to the individual soul has been the greatest means of godly change in our world that our world has ever witnessed. Okay, individuals being changed. As soon as you hit that mob level, that the group level, problems happen. So, you know, I was going to bring this up, and now it's a little bit more sensitive in light of yesterday, but, you know, I was asked to speak to our student body right after the Douglas shooting. And so, it was very raw. We had students in our school whose friends died. Those were their friends at Douglas. And so, it was very, very traumatizing. And I spoke to them for, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, and at the end, I appealed to the individual soul, and I said, the gospel in a heart does not allow that type of thing to happen. If you want people not to shoot, they got to get the gospel in their soul, and they'll be changed by Christ. So, and I had a whole bunch of kids get upset with that because they're so into this mob mentality. They get on TikTok, they see the mobs, and they're all shouting and hollering for gun control, gun control. Don't you think the answer is gun control? So what do you need gun control if, if people ha are saved and they have the gospel? The gospel is gun control, okay? So Paul's appealing to the individual soul because it becomes the answer to these problems. Now, we have slipped to a point, if you've noticed, now they're even attacking prayer. We don't want, they keep saying, we don't want to hear you're praying for these people. We don't want to hear you're praying for these people. What is the prayer doing? Well, guess what? I don't know what the prayer is doing, but I know the one who we pray to does something, yeah. okay? So at, at every level, there's an attack. So the gospel to the individual has been the greatest power the world has seen for positive change in the world. Alexander, Napoleon Bonaparte said this. I was just talking to him the other day. <laughs> <laughs> dead. <laughs> he said this. He said, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? It was upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would still die for him. Napoleon was amazed at the following of Jesus Christ and people willing to die for him thousands of years after he lived. And he knows as somebody who founded empires that he required force where Jesus did much more through love. Now, look, at, look what happened with Joseph and Mary. They literally, through their obedience to governing authorities, even though they are commanded to make a very arduous, long journey with a very pregnant woman, they were obedient to that call to, to go to their hometown for the census, even though it was for the purpose of taxing them and having their money go to that oppressive government. So here's a call to say, we want to make sure you're paying taxes, so you're going to be, we're taking a census of you, so make this long, very uncomfortable journey with your very pregnant wife, bring, go to your hometown of, of uh, Bethlehem, and so we know to tax you. So nothing good is in that deal for Mary and Joseph, but they were obedient. And they ended up fulfilling prophecy through their obedience to wrong government. Justin Martyr, 
when he defended the Christian faith to Emperor Antonin, Antonius Pius, he did so by appealing to the lives of Christians as people that were the most scrupulous in paying their taxes and obeying the civil magistrate. That was his witness to this emperor. Notice these Christians that you want to attack and how scrupulous they are in paying their taxes and obeying civil magistrates. It became salt and light and a witness and a testimony is our obedience. Because Paul's making the point that when you're asked to submit to your governing authorities, you're being asked to submit to God who put these authorities in place. Okay, in Isaiah 40, God says, I lift them up and then I simply breathe on them and they're gone. It's up to him when they come. It's up to them when they go. And I think if we find obedience in a people group, you'll see God bring great leaders to them. When there's disobedience in a people group, you'll see as discipline, he'll raise up bad leaders as a discipline. Because what do you do under those bad leaders? You pray a lot more, don't you? Okay. So recognizing this authority, listen, Psalm 100 verse 3 tells us, uh, it says, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. There's the call to authority, right? It's he who made us, not we ourselves. Isn't that the exact call of evolution? We just kind of made ourselves, our molecules fell perfectly in order and we just appeared like this. We went from the goo to you via the zoo, right? Okay. That's from Norman Geisler. I can't take credit for that one. All right. Now, if, um, if parents feel it appropriate to say to their child, I brought you into this world and I can take you out, how much more so does God have that right to say that? Okay, he is our authority. He put these governments in place. And for either our blessing or our discipline, he puts governments in place to teach a nation, to teach a people group about himself. You see that through the entire Old Testament. The good judges, the bad judges. The good kings, the bad kings. Okay, it's always working for God's purposes in, in that people group. All right, verse 2. Therefore, because of the authority of God and what he does with governments, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So to resist government is to resist the purposes of God for that government, and it brings judgment upon ourselves. Now, naturally, if we're called by God to obey our civil governing authority, then this warning against disobedience will make sense. If, you don't, if, if God puts it in place for a purpose and you disobey it, then you're thwarting the purposes of God for it. But let's go to Acts 5.29 and see when it's actually appropriate now to disobey your governing authorities. This is me, Acts chapter 5. All right, Acts chapter 5. Let's start in verse 22. Acts 5, 22 says, But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison... They returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So no one came and told them. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Isn't that cool? Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, and they feared the people lest they sh should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. <laughs> but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. <clears throat> The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God exalted to the, his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So here Peter says, to the high priest of Israel, I'm to obey God 
rather than when you tell me not to talk about him. And he even says that Jesus that I'm talking about is the one that you killed. Okay, so I'm out there telling the people that the guy that was killed, you killed him. I'm supposed to be telling people about this. God has us to do this. You as high priest tell us not to, but you're the high priest. So you should be able to answer this question properly. Who should we obey, man or God? Okay, so Peter is going to disobey his, his authority and it's going to be correct and right to do so here. All right, now back to Romans. Uh, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So Paul is, is building upon how he finished chapter 12. In chapter 12, he quotes, in verse 19, he quotes the Bible saying, um, he says, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So he tells us to be peaceable with all men. It's not our place to take revenge on people. Vengeance is God's to do. He will repay. So since vengeance is God's, first of all, it means vengeance is not bad. It just means it's not ours to carry out. We will certainly do it improperly. God will certainly do it perfectly. So we are to leave vengeance to God. Okay, God will always have the scales of justice perfectly balanced in the long run, always. So if we improperly seek vengeance, now the scales of justice on us are imbalanced and he's got to balance it through discipline on us. So we're to trust God that he will perfectly avenge all the wrongdoing of the world, all of it. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, it's one of my favorite quotes, he says, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So Jesus teaches us to love our enemies, to be a light in, in, a, in, in a dark place. Jesus came as the light of the world, not a light, but as the light of the world, and he came and people preferred darkness. So he ends up dying. So Jesus didn't conform to the patterns of the world and join in the darkness. He stood as the bright shining light in this world, even though he pleaded with his father many times to be to be um, released from death. We read that in Hebrews. And yet, um, he followed through. He didn't conform to the darkness. He went through as the light to quench the darkness. Uh, I tell the kids when I teach on light and darkness, every day when I come in my classroom, there's darkness in there, and I flip a switch, and there's no battle that happens. The light conquers the darkness every single time. Okay? It's never a fight. The light wins every time. The only way darkness wins if you don't present light to it. And Jesus said, you're the light. So present yourself in the darkness and brighten the world. All right, verse 4. For he is God's minister to you for good. This is the government. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So two things we learned about government here. One, it's put in place by God. Two, God uses that government as an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So we get two very, very major theories or even laws out of this very verse. Now, I don't see it as possible that everybody listening is going to agree with this. So I am going to say that I believe everything I'm about to say now is straight 
from the Bible, from the heart of God. Um, but I know there's going to be emails on this one. All right. So, the first thing that this speaks to is capital punishment. As a teenager going into college, um, I was very much against capital punishment. I just thought, wow, that's just crazy weird for somebody to flip a switch and electrocute a person or stick them into a chamber, close that door and watch poison gas fill and watch them die. How weird is that? And then I read Genesis 9 and I was like, what did that just say? And this is what it just said. Genesis 9, 6 says this. Boy, I did a very bad job at my paper clips. They are not on the places I need them to be when I need them to be there. All right. Genesis 9, 6, right after the flood, God says this. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. So he, and then he tells us why he wants capital punishment. He says, for in the image of God, he made man. So, Larry King, if you remember Larry King, years ago said, I can never support a Christian's stance on pro-life because of the hypocrisy that they're also pro-capital punishment. He says, how could you be pro-life and pro-capital punishment? And I think that's how I thought back then. But now I realize how pro-life capital punishment is because it's pro-life of the victim. It is the most empathetic and highly valued thing you could say to that victim. Your life is so valuable that if it is wrongly snuffed out, the only thing that will bring justice in God's economy is your death. That is bringing incredible amounts of value to the victim. The most value you could give them. Anything less is saying to the victim, I know you died, but he doesn't have to. And I think you see that in victims' families. They seem to have nothing that will, anything less than capital punishment seems to be a statement on the lack of interest in their dead loved one. So I believe capital punishment is a pro-life position. It simply has the victim in mind and not the killer in mind. And I think it's a tremendous statement on the value of that victim. God says, that was my image bearer. Now, if using God's name in vain is a sin worthy of death, how much snuffing out his image completely is worthy of death? So God installs the death penalty and Paul backs it up in Romans 13. He says that's one of the main jobs of the government is to execute justice on the murderer with the sword. They're not to just be saber rattlers. They're to use that sword to execute justice. So you see that God will, will, will talk about the death penalty in terms of cleansing the land from the guilty blood that was shed. It cleanses the land, uh, capital punishment. So when people talk about, well, that was for that time period or whatnot, the one thing that doesn't allow the argument that it's just for that certain time period is when Paul brings that concept straight back to the creation narrative. Then it becomes a creation mandate. It's for all people, all time, every person in the world for all eras of world history. So Paul, here in Romans 13, talks about the sword. So you say, well, when did we first see the sword used for force? Genesis chapter 3, after the sin of Adam and Eve. Now that man is sinful, God arms the angels with swords, flaming swords. It's the threat of force for disobedience. It's not angels simply kindly saying, please don't step on the grass here anymore. It's saying, no, now the use of the sword will be used if you try to get back in the garden, which, which I think is an act of mercy because it says, I don't want you to eat of the tree of life and live forever. 
That's God's kindness because now they're separated from God and to eat of the tree of life in the garden and live forever is to be forever sinful and separated from God. But the tree of life is in the book of Revelation. It's in heaven. And the words that are used for the tree of life in heaven are come and eat freely. Isn't that amazing? Come and eat freely now of the tree of life and live forever. So the second thing that I think this passage uh, informs is what we call just war theory. Just war theory. What makes for a just war? Well, our country has just war theory. If an invader comes into our country and tries to take over our land, it is deemed just to fight back, to defend. Why? Because of pro-life. If anybody wants to affect and even wipe out our lives unjustly, we are called to answer with the sword. We're called to answer um, even up to the point of killing uh, the person trying to take over our land. If um, there are standards that set up just w uh, what makes for a just war, and it's largely come from Romans 13, an understanding of Romans 13, that one of the most important things a government can do for its people is to keep them safe, to keep them from just sitting around as sitting ducks where anybody can just come in and try to take over. So in verse 5, Paul says it this way. He says, therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath. So he's saying to disobey your government is to bring judgment on, on yourself because God put that government in there for your submission. But not only should you obey because of wrath, but listen, Christian, you should obey for conscience sake. In other words, at some point it needs to be enough to say, thus saith the Lord. And you go, that's enough for me. My conscience will bear witness that that's good and true and right because he said so. That's the relationship you're called to have with God. It's saying, I don't know about this whole just war theory, capital punishment. But then you read and you go, this is what I did with capital punishment in my early 20s. And I went, you know, if people say, well, what do you think about capital punishment? My answer became this, who cares what I think? The question is, what does he think? It's the only thing that matters. Because if I think differently, then by default, I'm wrong. Can never be right in disagreeing with God. So for conscience sake, to have peace with God, to walk obediently with God, if God wants to snuff out that government, he will, and he has. In the 1930s, Adolf Hitler announced he's bringing in a 1,000-year reign of Nazism. Twelve years later, it was gone. It was dead. Okay? Never even made it to its teenage years. Okay? The Bible says God simply breathes on it, and it's done, okay? That's where our prayer life comes back in. And then in verse 6, he says this, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. He says, not only do they have authority, not only do they wield the sword to execute wrath on the evil person, but they're to be funded by you through taxes because they're God's minister to you. So you want God's will done in your land, pay your taxes so the government can do what they're supposed to do, even if it's not what he wants them to be doing in the sense of it's, it's a negative thing because it's for our discipline, but we are to pay taxes for that very reason. Now, I remember talking to somebody at church years ago who had a job where he was able to work it without paying taxes. And very innocently, he told me what he did. And, and I knew he got paid cash and all that. And I just very casually said, do you pay taxes on that? And he said, no. Almost like, isn't that cool? And I said, how'd you get to church today? He said, I drove. I said, on what? He said, the roads. I said, that I help fund with my taxes. Wasn't that nice of me? to build you roads and things like that. And he's like, okay. And I said, well, how do you read the Bible and it, you get to Romans 13 and how do you justify not paying taxes? He goes, what does Romans 13 say about paying taxes? 
I said, it says pay him. He goes, it does? I said, yes. And he goes, then I will. That was the kind of obedience he was interested in, in doing. And he did. And what he was doing for cash, I challenged that as well. And he never did it again. And he got a job. And he's a lot poorer and he pays taxes. But he enjoys his obedience. It's a true story. It's a true story. Okay? He submitted himself. Okay? And he's doing well spiritually and that's more important than financially okay now so jesus taught the same principle in matthew chapter 22 starting in verse 15 this is one of my favorite stories of jesus it says the pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle jesus in his talk and they sent to him their disciples with the herodian saying teacher we know that you are true and teach the way of god and truth nor do you care about anyone, meaning you don't care about their opinion. Of course, he cares about people. You don't care about their opinions, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, when somebody high and mighty comes to you, you don't treat them differently than the tax collector and the sinner. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, they're talking about the tax that actually funds the soldiers that oppress them. So they're paying for their own oppression. That's very frustrating. So that's why the question comes up. Is it lawful for us to pay that tax or not? That tax does not work in our favor. So should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, just for a little background information on this, shortly before this, John the Baptist sent two of his followers to, to Jesus because John was in jail. And he sends two of his followers to Jesus and says, ask him this. Are you the coming one or should we wait for somebody else? John is in a crisis of doubt, isn't he? And that doubt is based on his circumstances. He figures, if I'm John the Baptist and he's Jesus, he should get me out of jail. But Jesus doesn't. He actually lets him die in jail because he said John the Baptist is the greatest of born among women, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. So he lets John go to heaven and be greater. Isn't that nice of him? But here's the thing. They delivered John's head on a silver platter, right? Okay? Delivered his head on a silver platter. So now, for Christmas or my birthday, I forget which one, um, uh, my, my stepson and stepdaughter bought me a denarius. They found a first century denarius online. Okay? And we know it must be real, right? It has a certificate of authenticity. But it's a first century denarius. And they put in this nice little package and frame and it's sitting on my desk. And they did it because they know I love this story. So before I had to look up and say, what does a denarius look like? And now I have one and I see what it looks like. And it looks like a dime. It's the size of a dime. It's as thin as a dime and all of that. And, and so Jesus asks right before the story, he says, the Pharisees come to him to ask him a question. He says, I'm not going to answer you unless you answer me something first. He says, John the Baptist, who do you think he was? And they huddle together and they say, if we say he was from heaven then he's going to say, well, why didn't you listen to him? And if we say he's not from heaven, then we're going to upset his crowd who take John to be a prophet. So they come back and they answer Jesus and they say, we don't know where he is from. And Jesus says, I'm not going to answer you your question. Okay? So he's got John the Baptist on his mind when this happens. And Jesus now says, they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. Now, they all know what the tax money looks like. It's like if something costs a quarter, I'm not going to say, show me a quarter. We all understand. what. But he wants this presentation of this tax money. So they brought him a denarius. It's got Caesar's his head right on it. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now, here's the brilliance of Jesus Christ. He said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. First of all, what did he have them do? Bring me a denarius. So on this silver dime-like thing with Caesar's head on it, he has Caesar's head delivered to him on a silver platter. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? <laughs> I don't know if there's anything to it. I'm just saying, how cool is he? All right? Now, then he says, Wh whose image and description? And they said, Caesar. So Jesus makes this deal with them. If your image is on something, then it's yours. That's Caesar's image. Give it to him. 
But he says, but render unto God the things that are God's. Because God put his image on something too. Every one of those Pharisees. Every one of us. And so Jesus says to them, we'll pay our taxes, but you need to give yourselves to God. Okay? It's pretty cool. So, and then another time Jesus is confronted with taxes and somebody questions the apostles like, hey, are you guys so highfalutin now that you're not paying taxes? And, uh, and Peter goes and goes, Jesus, are we paying taxes? He goes, of course we're paying taxes. He goes, go, first fish you catch, reach into the mouth and you'll have the tax money. And he does and he pays the tax money. Try that next April. Okay. <laughs> that is just so cool. Did you guys ever get to those moments you go, he's just so cool. Yes. He is just so cool how he does these things. All right. Now, so Paul says in verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. They're, they're, they're to rid you of the evildoer. They're to protect you from the evil nations. They do that through your taxes. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and hope, I'm sorry, honor to whom honor. So Paul here sets ethical parameters for taxation, for customs, for fear, and for honor. And what's the ethical parameters for these things? You give them to whom they're due. You give them to whom they're due. Now that's an important parameter. I remember... Um, I think it was the class of 2009, as I think of who it was. So these are graduates from 13 years ago. And I remember seeing the difference in their respect for teachers. And so I started challenging them on, on, on that because I could sense that they wouldn't respect the teacher unless the teacher earned their respect first. And so I suggested to them, you respect teachers just because they're a teacher. You come into the room respecting them, and then if they do something to lose your respect, that's something. But you start by giving it to them because they're a teacher, and they didn't agree with that. They said, no, they've got to earn it. And I said, how do you approach the police? Do you respect them for their badge or not? No, they got to earn it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And in 2009, I remember seeing this shift Two, we're not giving honor to whom honor is due. It's now a merit-based program for them. We will sit and watch and see if you earn it or not, and we'll decide to give it to you or not. It was not a good thing at all, but I can tell you, I think that was my observation of a turning point in society as they become the adults in society. And I've watched a video of people walking up to cops and pouring waters on their head and nothing's happening and everything's gotten disrespectful and all these things and crimes going up and you're going, I can't figure out why. So give honor to whom honor is due. Give taxes to whom taxes are due. And with this parameter, I want to bring up another ethical debate because I don't think I'm in enough hot water with everybody yet. Because for years and years and years, I taught something that I always get some negative feedback from my own teachers in the school. And um, it's about giving truth to whom truth is due. What do I mean by that? Well, when I read my scriptures, I see things like this. Uh, in fact, I'll bring you there. Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, we see this. All right. Joshua chapter 2, it says this, starting in verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. 
Where the men went, I don't know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Rahab lied to her king's people, correct? Yeah. She lied. Thou shalt not lie, says the Lord, correct? She's in violation of this. Now, then it says this. Well, that's a lot of text, but this is what happens. It says this. She makes a deal with them. She said, I've shown you kindness so that you'll show kindness to me and to my father's house. She says, give me a true token and spare my father, spare my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men, these Jewish men with a Gentile harlot say, our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. They pledge faithfulness to Rahab, even though she's condemned by the law of Moses as a Canaanite who's supposed to be killed. She's under the curse of Noah when he cursed the Canaanites through Ham. She's a woman, and they enter into covenant with her. And she's a harlot. She has four strikes against her. Yet these Jewish men enter into covenant with this woman who has four strikes against her. Why? Because she has a remarkable faith. Faith overcomes covenants. Our faith as Gentiles overcame the covenant to Abraham and included us in that covenant. It's how Gentiles are saved. Covenants overcome curses is what I should say. Covenants overcome curses. When Jesus institutes a new covenant, he's overcoming the curse of Eve because Eve took ate and gave that fruit to her husband. The Bible says Jesus took the bread, said, this is my body broken from you. It says he took it, he ate it, and he gave it to his apostles who were with him. He's overcoming the curse of death. He's entering into a new covenant that's overcoming curses. Covenants overcome curses. That's what's happening with Rahab. So how does she get to be this person? Because she had a decision to make when she's hiding the spies. And the decision was tell the truth or tell a lie. And she chose a lie and God blessed her for it. So how do we understand these things? How about the Egyptian midwives with Moses? When Moses is being born, Pharaoh told those midwives, any male child born to these Hebrew women, you're to throw in the Nile River. They don't. They save those boys and they give them to their mothers. And when they're confronted by Pharaoh's people, they have the authority of Pharaoh in her life. She lies. She says these Hebrew women get birth before you can possibly get to them. She lied. And the very next verse says, God gave them houses and families because they feared the Lord. The fear of the Lord and these women made them lie, and they were blessed for that lie. So I call it a righteous lie. These are righteous lies. And, <clears throat> and, if, and when I teach that, I always get emails from teachers. I heard you're teaching. The, and so I say, what, what would you do in this situation? Let's talk ethics for a minute, okay? And I, listen, this is the example I give every time. But because of what happened yesterday, it's, it's, it's more sensitive but I'm still going to give it. It's this. I say, what if we're in the school and we hear there's a shooter in the school and we're locking the kids down and I decide I'm going to leave my room and I'm going to go out in the main hallway and lock the double door so nobody can even get in our hallway. But as I'm doing that, there's the shooter. And he tells me he needs hostages. Do I have kids back there? Am I supposed to say I'm two doors down on the right, I just huddled all the kids in a corner and there they are? Or am I supposed to lie? I'm supposed to lie. Do you think if I told the truth and something bad happened that parents would email me and say, I'm very grieved over my child, but thank you for your honesty and the heat of the moment like that? No. What's ethical in that moment is a lie. That's ethical. Life and death situations reverse the ethic. Okay? When the Nazis are knocking on Helen, on, um, what's her name? Anne Frank. I almost called her Helen Keller. When they're knocking on Anne Frank's door, are they supposed to say, yes, you caught us, they're hiding over there? No. You're supposed to lie. You're supposed to lie in that situation. It's ethical. Okay? So you give truth to whom truth is due. The Nazis weren't due the truth. 
Okay? Pharaoh's people weren't do the truth. All right. So does this go for when Diana says, does his outfit make me look funny? <laughs> I can always tell the truth and say, no, honey, you look beautiful. And I can tell the truth, right? That was points, right, honey? Yes? No? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So this speaks, in, this has spoken into just war theory and capital punishment. All right, moving from there. Uh, back to Romans 13, verse 8. It says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, are you guys familiar with Monday Thursday? What's Monday Thursday? <laughs> yeah, it's the day before Good Friday. Yeah. And it's called Maundy because that's from the Latin word for mandate. And it's, it's named after a mandate because that's the day, the day before Good Friday, that Jesus gave a new command. He said to the apostles, a new command I give you. And what's the new command that he gave them? To love one another as I have loved you, right? Command. Okay, this is not where we pick and choose, am I going to follow that or not? You're either in obedience or you're walking in rebellion to a command. Okay, you're to love people as Jesus loved you. Now, with that command, um, Paul says here that you're to owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves has fulfilled the law. So Jesus says, a new command I'm giving you that fulfills the laws. It's to love. Verse 9, he says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's all summed up in that. Now, St. Augustine took that and said this. He said, love God. This was his ethical proclamation. He said, love God and then do whatever you want. Because he believes the love of God will forbid you from doing anything unethical. That you'll have to stop loving God for a period of time if you're going to actually sin. Okay, but if you continue to love God, you'll find yourself not sinning. So he says, love God and do whatever you want. Um... And he says it's summed up in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus taught that, he was asked a question. Do you remember it? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And from that came the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan, which I think is Luke 10. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yes, it is. Luke 10, 25. And I want to go through that real quick because Monday, Thursday, mandate Thursday, love others as I have loved you. And now Paul says all of the law is summed up in this command, love your neighbors yourself. The question came up, who's my neighbor? And when that question was asked, Jesus said this, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. Now right now, you know Jesus' listeners are going, thank God a priest came down the road at that time. Surely this man is going to be cared for by a priest. And the next verse says, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, okay, the priestly tribe is here. Surely the man's in good hands now. When he arrived at the place came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain... Do you know how despised Samaritan were, Samaritans were by Jews? Yep. Do you know the tension that when Jesus... It's clear he's going to reveal the hero of the story now. And you know his Jewish audience was saying, do not say a Samaritan right now. Say anybody else. Do not make the hero of the story a Samaritan. 
Who is that person for you that you can't free your heart to make them the hero of your story? Okay, think about that. Because Jesus says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So the neighbor is even your unsaved enemy is your neighbor. People will say this, we're all children of God. The Bible rejects that. The Bible says that the love of God, oh, the love the Father has for us that we should be called the children of God. Okay, you become the child of God when you marry the Son of God, spiritually marry Jesus Christ as your bridegroom. Now his father becomes your father. So now you're a child of God. But everybody is a neighbor. Everybody's a neighbor. And that's your command to love, is everybody, even your enemies. Because Jesus is not interested in you loving your enemies for the sake of evil people getting loved on. He's interested in evil people becoming your friend. And, and as Martin Luther King Jr. said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So, back to Romans 13 to finish up. Verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Paul's using the word salvation there not as the moment you get saved, but the moment you experience the fullness of your salvation in heaven, that you are now in an eternity of joy and bliss and health and the presence of Jesus Christ. He says, that moment is nearer now than when you first believed. In fact, that moment is nearer now than when we started the study this evening, isn't it? It's forever nearer, okay? In fact, knowing that each new day brings you a day closer to death, you know that, right? That's not news to you, right? Yet we celebrate birthdays, don't we? Okay? And we don't say, happy one year closer to your death, <laughs> right? We don't say that, even though that's the reality, right? We say, happy birthday. Why? It's God's grace. God allows us to enjoy the countdown to our death because he has something wonderful for us, doesn't he? Okay, and we don't fear it. We don't fear the passing of time because there's a tremendous grace that goes with it. Um, so Paul says this, you have to wake up though. You have to wake up and know that every moment of your life is the closest moment to the realization of your salvation. And that doesn't mean you're allowed to sit around and do nothing because you're saved. It means you can't sit around and do nothing. Your salvation means you've become extremely important in this world as light in darkness. What good is a light that never gets switched on, never has power connected to it? It's worthless. It promotes darkness. So he says, wake up out of that. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let's put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Everything we say and do reflects either light or darkness as its source. Everything we say and do reflects light or darkness as the source of what we're saying, what we're doing. It not only informs us of the conditions of our souls, but it also serves as a witness for or against Jesus Christ. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2 He says this. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 
verse 2. He says, you are our epistle written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. He's saying, what God has done in your life has become a letter written on human hearts. Okay? They know God in a certain way based on how you're living your life. That informs them when you say, I'm a Christian, I follow God, I follow Jesus Christ. Now they observe what you say, what you do, and that informs them of God in a certain way. They're looking at you and, and, and evaluating what has God done with this person, and you become a letter that's written. I don't know if I said this last Wednesday or last Sunday, but it's been said that there's actually five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the believer. And most people read the believer first, and then determine if they want to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're a letter written on human hearts. You mean something. You're a fragrance either to life or to death. Okay. So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor is everybody. And the final verse, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Make no provision for the flesh. That means even if you wanted to sin, the thing that you want to sin with is not even available to you. Because if it's available to you, you're making a provision for it. So there was an old country preacher who said, if you want to get over drunkenness, you best not tie your horse to the post in front of the saloon. Right? That's a provision for the flesh. Okay? So get rid of the provisions. Get rid of, of the things. Why? Because Paul says, wake up. Your salvation's closer now than it was before. It's always getting closer and closer. And you're light and you're a letter and you're a fragrance. Okay? And if you're making provisions of the flesh, it's ruining all that. So the thing that he's highlighting for tonight is submission to your authorities. Okay? Giving obedience to who obedience is due, honor to who honor is due, taxes to whom taxes are due. Man, would the mayor love this sermon tonight, right? Okay? So, because ultimately, what you should see in the government is something that God is up to. And you want to follow the thing that God is up to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you, Lord. And Lord, we all fall short of the submission that you're calling us to. So, Lord, we repent now of that, and we want tonight's time together to be a springboard into greater obedience, Lord, greater trust in you that leads to our obedience and our submission to all the things that are from your hand. And, Lord, you don't have to explain everything to us. We want to just hear that you've said it and we do it. But thank you, Lord, for your word, for the clarity that it brings, and we pray, God, that you would allow our lives to be spent for you, poured out for you, pleasing to you, and that we may know, Lord, the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.